Okay guys, so in conclusion to all that with the ice coil, you know, it did leave just a tiny little kink there still. About the same as you get with just water. So I'm not sure if the extra hassle was worth it. That's really not bad at all. I mean, completely acceptable. Hey, what's going on everybody? Tonight we're going to be checking out a little experiment I'm doing on bending steel tubing coils. This is a stainless steel tubing and in the past I've just filled these tubes with water to do the job. But I was reading through the comments the other night and Delicious De Blair mentioned something about putting contaminants in the water. And effectively this changes the bulk modulus of water. And the reason that's important to me is because in the past I have been reluctant to freeze the water in the coil knowing that it would expand and alter the wall thickness of the tubing, maybe make it weaker, maybe even burst the tube. So I don't do it. Um, I, you can do it with copper, but it stretches it and it will burst it on occasion. But putting a contaminant like dish soap in the water alters the bulk modulus in such a way that or modulus, I don't know how to say it, I've only read it, but I know how to do the equations and I'm very familiar with the mathematical formulas involved in the expansion and compression of fluids and substances. So it dawned on me that if I use dish soap as a contaminant, maybe the ice won't expand so much that it has the power to burst the tube. So oh, this is a nightmare. All right. Interflon. Saved my butt right there. I'm probably going to regret shoving this in there. Things are not going well right now. But on the bright side, that's typical. Okay, let's see here. It's looking good so far. Bending the ease off there. Okay, it's not doing as good as I want it to, but it's working. I think I figured out the secret. I know what I've been doing wrong now. Yeah, I figured it out. So if I can get this thing out of here. I don't think I like this. I'm getting some bending and strange rupturing and slushing. I think now at this point, um, from what I'm feeling, I need to stop and let this thing thaw out. I can feel kinks forming where the slush is breaking, where there's like a, two slugs of frozen and I got like a slight kink right there that normally would not have happened. You can see there, there's a subtle bend. That's, that's minor though. We can live with that. Not bad at all. What, what happened was, is I was trying to bend it right there rather than apply force here and push down and bend and keep moving my hand as I go. I think that was the important part, but there's a sharp corner right there. So despite this being froze, we still got a minor, minor kink right there. It's not a perfect transition. So in my eyes, it's just as good with, with just water in there. Not too bad. There's a minor kink there.
All right, when you're shooting video without hitting record, it's time to go to bed. So that's the hardest part of the transition right there. But what I will say about the ice coil is one of the features it exhibited is that it will not wrap tight around the mandrel that you're wrapping. Whereas just a water-filled coil alone will wrap tight around whatever it is you're wrapping it on to where it's it's got a little bit of a snugness to it. There's no elasticity in the bend. It just seems to be plastic. So that's one thing that, that you may want your coil to end up slightly bigger than the mandrel when it's done. For instance, if you're sliding it over something like I've done here. But as far as um, just turning small coils like this on the inside, you don't need to ice it up. Just on tight transitions like that right there, that one bend out of the, the entire coil is the hardest bend to, to achieve. I need something that's just a little bit more suitable for the process. But just wanted to post this video because I don't have any footage of me doing this with ice. And a lot of people have told me they've seen my water-filled coil tube bending videos. And they've told me to put uh, the coil in the fridge and freeze it. So just thought I'd give that a, a little try. In the old days, they used to use dish soap in the ice so I gave that a shot and uh, when they would make trumpets an individual left that comment years and years ago so we're gonna get go ahead and braze this thing together now after we empty the water out of it of course but at least I don't have to go through the dread of removing the salt out of this coil so never use salt to turn a coil unless you really know what you're doing um, it will turn into a huge pill and you can't get it out of the coil can say one thing to improve one's brazing abilities it would be pay attention to the after results of your flux if it's burnt and black like this you're getting the, the work area too hot and I kind of knew that I could see it happening the metal was just getting too red hot you want it to get a dull red just barely getting red and in contrast you can see here this area doesn't have a whole lot of color going to it the flux didn't get baked to death same thing with this joint here. That's a real good braze joint. Up here is just a little cooked. So, and you don't want to do that because once you cook it, there's nothing bad about it per se other than it looks like heck and it's harder to clean. But if, let's say we actually wanted material to stick in that location, you cannot get material to flow now on those black areas. No matter what you do. If you do some heavy abradement with a piece of uh, rod, then possibly, but um, it's just not worth it. You're, you'll be wasting material. And this stuff's $6 a freaking rod. So you're looking at about a $12 brazing job. And the reason I didn't uh, try and just weld it is because, as I said, I don't have any argon to back purge. And with something this thin, I still worry about sugaring. Even with the argon, when you get stainless steel so hot, it has to be passivated in order to maintain its corrosion, anti-corrosion abilities, I should say. But uh, yeah, there you go. There's $12 worth of braise. And then another $25 for the guy who did it. <laughs> so, definitely an expensive process, but... At least now we know this stainless steel is still stainless steel and it won't rust out over time. This is a monotube boiler and it will at times have steam passing through it where the coil may even get red hot in some spots. So steam is very destructive to red hot metal. I put this piece on here at a bend because it just fits so nicely around this hump. This outer coil is a little bit bigger than the other ones. works for me this boiler has three parts this is the preheat this section here is the boiler itself and down inside of there you can see the superheat coil which in this case I believe was a nine turn let's get a quick look at this bad boy before I ship it off 
so that's where we're at now we're getting ready to flare this end up and uh go from there one other tip i want to give you guys when it comes to working with stainless steel tubing never use a tubing cutter in the flaring process of stainless steel tubing they say it work hardens the metal and causes an inferior double flare if you're ever doing any double flare work or even just regular flare so just a nice little tidbit from an expert not me uh, I, I got that tip from an expert so you can trust its validity